again, welcome to the Foley and Lardner Lessons from the Inaugural Year of the New Post-Grant Patent Office Proceedings, What Separates the Winners from the Losers conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Sivan Galinsky. Please go ahead. Thank you for joining today's web conference. The title of today's session is Lessons from the Inaugural Year of New Post-Grant Patent Office Proceedings, What Separates the Winners from the Losers. Before I turn the presentation over to our presenters, I'd like to briefly offer a few housekeeping items for your assistance. If you have questions for our presenters, we encourage you to post your questions throughout the program by typing them into the Adobe Connect chat forum. If time does not allow for us to address your questions, we will follow up with you after the program. For audio assistance, please press star zero. The program will last approximately one hour and is being recorded. Foley will apply for one CLE credit after the program. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log in to both the Adobe Connect session and the audio session with your first and last name and email address. Those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form that can be found in your registration confirmation email. Enter the five-digit code that will be announced during the, pr the presentation and return the form to sgolinski at foley.com immediately after the program. <laughs> Please log into the program using the confirmation links provided to you. If you have any difficulty with the login process, please work with the help support noted on the confirmation email. Com. And now I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to our presenters. Today we have C. Edward Polk, Jr., former USPTO Associate Solicitor and current Chief Litigation Officer at Excella Pharma Sciences, LLC, Andrew Belouche, former Expert Legal Advisor to the Undersecretary and Director of the USPTO and current Vice Chair of the Patent Office Trials Group at Foley & Lardner, Stephen B. Mabius, IP Partner with Foley & Lardner and member of the Patent Office Trials Group. Ed, Andy, and Steve, please proceed. Well, thank you and, and welcome everybody to our conference today. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, run through these initial slides that just provide the background of today's presenters. And as you just heard, we have Ed Pope joining us, uh, who's currently with Excella Pharma Sciences, LLC. We also have uh, myself. Uh, I'm a former patent examiner at the U.S. Patent Office and currently partner at Foley and Lardner and a member of the Patent Office Trials Group. And with me today is Andy Belouche, uh, who's a former expert legal advisor to the Undersecretary of the Patent Office and the Vice Chair of Foley's Patent Office Trials Group. This slide here is just to give a, a summary of what we hope to cover today. We're, we're going to go over the, the current state and background on inter-parties reviews and cover a few statistics. We're going to compare and contrast inter-parties review with district court litigation and prior uh, proceedings. We'll also discuss briefly how the Presenius v. Baxter decision which just came out from the Federal Circuit, is likely to impact post-grant proceedings. We're going to summarize about 10 lessons that we've learned from actual cases during the first year of inter-parties review practice. And we'd also like to cover the circumstances when you might want to think about using inter-parties review, covered business method, or post-grant review as the method of choice for attacking validity of a U.S. patent. So that, that's a summary of what we will cover today. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my co-presenter, Andy Belish, to lead us off with the next slide. So the, the AIA made major changes to the U.S. patent system. Um, definitely the biggest changes in 60 years um, we all know that the AIA changed the, moved the U.S. from a uh, first-to-invent patent system over to a first-to-file system. But what is shaping up to be a much bigger uh, impact on uh, the U.S. patent system is all of the new third-party avenues 
uh, for attacking a patent in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as an alternative to litigation. So we have ex parte reexamination, which has existed since 1980, and that remains uh, relatively unchanged by AIA uh, and remains a viable option. On top of that, you have the new interparty review, IPR, which takes the place of interparty reexamination, which was created in 1999. IPR is now available for uh, use against all patents, regardless of filing date. So this applies to patents that existed before the AIA uh, and those after the AIA, uh, regardless of filing date. So it will it, it now does apply to both first to file patents and first to invent patents. Another uh, post-grant proceeding is post-grant review, or PGR. This proceeding is only available against first to file patents. Um, so as first to file patents, which uh, have an effective filing date on or after March 16, 2013, as these first to file patents begin issuing in bigger numbers, we'll see PGR pick up as well. Um, on top of that, for a specific subset of patents, uh, so-called covered business method patents, uh, you have a dedicated proceeding, CBM. Uh, covered business method patents are those that relate to a financial product or service, uh, and it is a specific proceeding just for them. So CBM is available uh, to attack covered business method patents in addition to being able to attack those same patents with IPR and PGR. And then finally, um, interferences are uh, shifted over to uh, a new proceeding, derivation, and this is for inventorship challenges. Uh, this lays out the timeline that the USPTO has um, proposed and is being implemented now for IPR and, and PGR. And what we see is basically two phases of the um, proceeding. A pretrial uh, phase that begins when the petition is filed, goes through an optional patent owner preliminary response, and ends with a decision on the petition, a decision by the board whether to go forward with the IPR or PGR. Uh, and that, by rule, should take no more than six months. After that point, the AIA by statute, limits the entire proceeding through to a final written decision uh, for no more than 12 months, uh, the deadline, which can only be extended by up to six additional months in exceptional circumstances. And we have not seen that happen yet, and it will probably be rare. So in the typical case, you're going to have an entire proceeding going from filing of the petition through a final written decision by the board, which either cancels the claims or affirms the claims uh, in original form or amended form, that all is going to take one and a half years. And when you compare that to district court litigation, that is faster than almost all district courts, um, may, except for a couple rocket dockets. So that is going to have a, um, a big impact, as we are already seeing on litigation stays. So this one and a half years is much faster than the old re-exams that typically have gone for three, four, five years. Um, and we've already seen evidence of this um, just last week uh, in the Softview versus Apple case in the District of Delaware. Uh, the Delaware District Court granted uh, Apple and Kiyosera's and other defendants um, motion to stay the litigation pending the uh, recently instituted IPR, and they, the same court on the same patents in the same case more than a year ago denied a motion to stay pending interparty reexamination, uh, citing the long pendency of reexams. So in this case, in the Softview case last week, the court was impressed by the fact that the AIA statute limits these proceedings to, to one year from the date of the decision to a, a, 
on the petition to a final written decision. So we are seeing more stays now because of this compressed uh, statutory timeline. But we won't always get a stay. And in fact, in, in a case uh, that I was involved in, we just recently had a case where the court denied a stay, even though the court recognized the faster timeline for inter-parties review. And there are a number of factors that go into the consideration. In our case, there were additional patents involved in the litigation that weren't being subjected to inter-parties review. So the court uh, concluded that there shouldn't be a stay issued in that particular case. And uh, Ed, I wonder if we could get your comments from the point of view of a pharmaceutical company about whether, whether a stay is, is helpful or harmful in a given situation. Well, yeah, I guess one of the things, as Steve said, our company, we are involved mainly in Hatch-Waxman litigation. And I guess it seems to the stay, the whole proceeding in the stay itself seems to cut both ways because from the f one standpoint, you look and see, it seems to proceed pretty quickly. And from that standpoint, say if you're the person, a company trying to make a generic product and you want to challenge the patents, you could get a decision from the PTO much uh, earlier before you get to trial, which would, again, from the person who's, who's tr challenging the patents would be a good thing. But what would be of concern is the stay, because certainly during a Hacks-Waxman litigation, the uh, patentee or the, 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 the brand company certainly would like the proceeding to take as long as possible, where the generic company is certainly on the opposite side and want, wanted to go as quick as possible. So if you guys could maybe kind of talk to that What's the, what have you seen the likelihood of a stay actually happening uh, and who actually can request a stay? Yeah, the, the likelihood of a stay, it's going to increase definitely if all patents in the litigation are challenged in the office proceeding. Um, also, the sooner the motion to stay and the um, inter-party review is filed, uh, the better the likelihood, so that's another factor. Um, but I think if, if those factors are satisfied, I, you see courts leaning on the fact that you have a strict one-year statutory time limit. Uh, they're satisfied with that and maybe want to um, put this case on, on hold uh, on their docket. But that, again, maybe it, we sometimes see a, a judge by judge, you know, personality uh, outcome on that. And this slide shows and putting together all of the new third party invalidity attacks on one timeline, going from the filing of the application before it's issued up to issuance and all the way through the expiration of the 20 year term. At every virtually every stage of the patent's life, there is an opportunity for a third party to attack the patent. Uh, so there, the AIA created these new pre-issuance submissions that can be filed by any third party uh, and submitting prior art to the examiner. Um, and then after issuance, you'll have the nine-month post-grant review window. Uh, after that, the uh, inter-party review second uh, phase window, and all throughout, you've got ex-party re-examination as an option. And the different colored lines show um, the estoppel, and we'll talk more about estoppel in a, a few slides, but um, you know, estoppel limits the ability of a challenger to mount another attack based on uh, the same art or uh, art that could have been raised. And you see the green line shows no estoppel. So there are several ways to uh, sequence these challenges where you get no estoppel. Uh, so multiple rounds of attack using the same art or art that you knew and could have raised before. So from a patent owner's perspective, you need to be prepared uh, for an entire uh, patent's term of vulnerability, including before issuance, and then from a challenger's perspective, it's 
multiple opportunities uh, to take out the competitor's patent. And here we have recent statistics from the USPTO. Uh, as of the end of July, we have uh, a total of 396 IPRs uh, filed, uh, 39 covered business method reviews, and one post-grant review, uh, as well as one derivation proceeding. Uh, and these are impressive numbers. Um, and it shows that, uh, contrary to, to some folks' views before the AIA and uh, leading up to September 16, 2012, when AI, IPR became available, some thought that the high fees for IPR might dissuade petitions, uh, as well as the uh, estoppel effect. But here we see that these challenges are being filed, and these numbers actually make the PTO's board one of the most active patent um, venues uh, in the United States, uh, more than almost all district courts. Uh, and you see, in terms of the breakdown in technology, most of these are uh, targeted in the electrical and computer uh, groups. Uh, chemical and biopharm uh, account for about 10% or less each. And then we have a, a small amount of design uh, petition patents being challenged. Um, and I think we might see more of that given the importance in the, of, of design patents in the uh, Samsung, Google, Apple litigations. And then the, what's also interesting is the grant rate, the rate at which the board institutes uh, an IPR. Uh, and it's an, at a 92% grant rate, institution rate. Um, so these petitions, when they are filed, are being granted at a, at a, highly, uh, at a pretty high rate. And then another um, statistic that jumps out on this slide is the settlements. So settlements are available in uh, these IPRs and CBM proceedings, unlike in re-exam. And 34 settlements uh, as of the end of July, uh, that's nearly 30% of all instituted IPRs. So a significant number are being settled. Uh, and this creates an interesting dynamic, um, perhaps Ed may want to talk about from the in-house or pharma perspective, uh, this option to settle the case uh, as, uh, as opposed to in re-exam, where there's no way to pull back that uh, re-exam request. Yeah, exactly. I actually, I'll kind of speak to that from a recent uh, experience that we had. There was a case that we had filed recently where we filed a re-exam uh, shortly after the case was filed. And this is actually right when the, uh, the proceeding, right when it was turning over to the new proceeding. Uh, we had gotten sued before the uh, new law got into effect, so we couldn't take advantage of the inter-parties review. So we had to, our, our only option was filing the re-exam, so we did that. And as we got into settlement, been able to actually settle the case or actually stop the, the proceeding at the PTO. That might have brought the parties a little closer to being able to settle, but uh, ultimately that was a sticking point and we ended up going to trial anyway. So I think that new procedure, at least being able to settle it, settle it does have the offer the, the, the ability to file the proceeding, but always use it as a sword at some point if you want to, to settle it, uh, to take it away uh, through a settlement negotiation. And this is the last slide uh, in, in the intro part of this presentation, just to, so we're all clear on the procedural similarities and differences between IPR, PGR, and CBM. Um, so IPR, um, as, as we mentioned, is available for all patents, but when first to file comes around uh, and those patents are issued, uh, it, IPR is only available after the first nine months, whereas in those first nine months, 
uh, PGR it will be available. Um, and covered business method is available for all patents and uh, the only requirement is that you are, for standing, is that you are sued or charged with infringement of a covered business method patent. IPR is, has also some differences in terms of what evidence and argument can be submitted in the petition. IB, IPR is more limited. It's limited to um, patents and printed publications uh, with grounds limited to anticipation under 102 and obviousness under 103, whereas uh, PGR and CBM is open to all evidence, uh, not just patents and printed pubs, uh, and is uh, open to all invalidity grounds that can be raised in litigation. Um, estoppel is a, another consideration, and this has to do with um, the limit on the petitioner's ability to bring a subsequent challenge after doing one of these proceedings at the patent office. Um, so for example, a petitioner that brings an IPR challenge um, will, once a final written decision is rendered by the board, um, will be precluded or stopped from bringing in any subsequent office proceeding or in a civil litigation, uh, such as district court or ITC, uh, any invalidity challenge based on any ground the petitioner raised or reasonably could have raised, which basically means that if you are a petitioner, uh, you cannot expect that you can keep references in your pocket to save uh, as a hedge uh, for a later uh, litigation or uh, file it again in, a, in another office proceeding against the same patent. Uh, PGR has the same limits. Uh, interestingly, CBM uh, is different with respect to the estoppel as to subsequent civil actions. So the, there the estoppel is limited to only the grounds actually raised in the CBM. So a prior art reference or argument that you did not make but could have made, you can raise then in a subsequent litigation. And of course, CBM is limited to uh, financial products or services, uh, which do not cover a technological invention. And we'll talk about the IPR uh, limitation deadline, the time limit uh, within which you must file the IPR uh, one year after being served with uh, an infringement complaint. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, take this one here. Um, when it, uh, it talks about when and how does uh, IPR uh, inter inter-parties review and post-grant make sense. Uh, well, one of the timing considerations, again, I'll look at this from the point of the Hatch-Waxman litigation, which is kind of the, the area where, where I practice and our company is, is involved in litigation. Um, you do have that 45-day window in which you, uh, you send your letter to the to the brand company, let them know that you file an ANDA or an NDA or, or whichever the case may be, and they have that window in which to file suit. And I think that gives you a little bit of time during that period to think about whether or not you want to bring uh, litigation, uh, actually bring the proceeding over to the PTO, uh, because once you get sued, assuming that you do get sued, you have that one-year window in which to actually file an action at the PTO. Now, the estoppel considerations, I know that's always been uh, uh, an issue when you're dealing with the PTO proceedings because there are a lot of uh, at least thought processes out there that you're better off in, in district court than dealing with the patent office. Having worked at the patent office, I tend to look at that a little differently. I believe that you can get a good decision from the PTO. So at least from our perspective as a company, you know, if we, if we are making that consideration, we would be willing to bypass uh, invalidity challenge at the district court in, in view of uh, dealing with the proceeding at the PTO. Now, one of those, one of the considerations why I have always kind of favored proceedings at the PTO because there is a lower burden of proof, which is the most reasonable, uh, broadest reasonable construction standard that the PTO uses for doing its claim constructions versus what the district court 
does. And I guess that also now will come to a, a two-edged sword uh, when it comes to the claim construction that you may get at the PTO because uh, in talking about this issue with uh, some other folks probably, you know, within, within the last couple of weeks, the thought, the, the thought that was brought up is, well, what if you go, you're at the PTO, you get a claim construction uh, from the from the from the uh, proceeding at the PTO, which is fairly broad construction that they give to the claims. The question would be, and I'll throw this to Andy and Steve. Maybe you can you guys can chime in on this. What would be has been your experience, or what have you seen out there when it comes to a district court just adopting maybe a broader construction that the PTO has given, and now from the person the accused or infringer's standpoint you may have the nice broad construction that you want at the PTO, but now that broad construction could conceivably hurt you if the district court just looks at that and adopts it. could hurt you from an infringement perspective. So do you, do you have any kind of thoughts on how that has played out or what you see in, in any way of district courts just wholeheartedly adopting constructions that are been given by the PTO? Well, I think that's certainly a risk that a petitioner needs to think about when there's a parallel patent litigation. Um, I think that the courts do recognize that the patent office, unlike the court, applies the broadest reasonable construction to the claims. But ultimately, if that construction becomes important to upholding the validity of certain subject matter in the claims, then I think the uh, patent owner may take that argument into the court and say, this is really now a part of the file history for this patent, and it was important to the reasoning uh, that allowed the board to uphold validity. And there may be some uh, level of persuasiveness in that kind of an argument, but I think as far as the very initial uh, claim construction that could be adopted, the courts may still independently decide their con claim construction. And certainly what we've seen is that the board will tend to independently decide its claim construction when, when in situations where there's a prior litigation that has already construed the patent. So I, I think to an extent, these are going to be independent decisions by either the board or the court. But if the proceeding has gone all the way to a final decision in inter parties review, there may be a, sort of a file wrapper estoppel type of argument about the claim construction. And I should also add that um, the broadest reasonable interpretation is set by regulation and not by the AIA. Um, there are legislative proposals out now uh, to uh, have the PTO adopt the Phillips uh, district court style claim construction methodology so that patent owners don't have to be, um, you know, and, and the petitioner all, as well doesn't have to be uh, jumping from one claim construction to another at the two proceedings. This is generally favored by patent owners um, to bring the PTO on board with uh, Phillips-style uh, district court claim construction, uh, but generally opposed by petitioners who like the broader uh, construction at the PTO. In the last part of this slide, I'll touch it when it talks about cost considerations, and this is certainly uh, being a smaller pharma company as we are, this is your cost is certainly consideration in any of the proceedings. And generally, when you look at the district court litigation, given how broad the scope of discovery is there, uh, certainly that's usually a, a broad enough proceeding that is not something that you can do in-house. Uh, so even though you may have multiple proceedings ongoing with the district court litigation and the PTO proceeding, uh, at least from our standpoint, we look at it that uh, we internally would be able to handle an, uh, a, a proceeding at the PTO versus having to farm that out in every instance. So that to us is also something where we look at it that we could be able to reduce the scope of the litigation that's in district court and do some of the work ourselves in-house from the PTO side.
And next, we'd like to briefly cover the Fresenius v. Baxter case, which I mentioned at the, at the beginning. And this was a recent decision from the Federal Circuit where the, uh, the patent owner had achieved a successful outcome in patent litigation, but at the last minute got the rug pulled out from under them due to a final decision in a reexamination which found the patent invalid and ultimately the court decided that even though there had been a, a judgment of damages awarded in the parallel litigation, the finality of the invalidity decision in reexamination trumped the finality of judgment in the patent litigation. So the uh, damages award was was ultimately vacated, but the significance of this case is that it points out how important timing is, and if an inter-parties review is started at a point in time before there's going to be a final judgment, which really has to be the case because you have a one-year uh, time period after being sued for infringement to initiate IPR. So if you if you choose IPR, it's likely that you're going to get a final decision on validity before there's a final decision in parallel litigation. And this is a case to watch because um, there's a petition for en banc rehearing uh, now pending, and both the uh, Intellectual Property Owners Association and BIO have filed briefs in support of the Federal Circuit taking this case on bunk. And now we're going to go over the uh, 10 lessons that, that we've learned from the first year of practice in IPRs. And the first one relates to choosing an expert. And, and I think that in almost every IPR that we've seen so far, the petition has always included at least one declaration from an expert witness. And it's not a requirement, but it seems to be the case that when you have prior art that needs to be explained or interpreted, uh, you need to get the evidence of an expert into the record at the earliest possible stage. So what have we learned about how to choose an expert based on what's happened in the first year of IPRs, I, I think what we've learned is that you, you need an expert who can stand up to the statements that are presented in the written declaration. And some of this is obvious uh, from experience in litigation, but what we've seen is that cross-examination, which you have a right to do in an inter-parties review, can lead to significant undercutting of the written statements in the declaration. So if you have a really effective cross-examination of the expert witness, that will neutralize the effect of the declaration. So uh, it's also important to think about the full record of publications by the declarant so that you can make sure there's no inconsistent statements or other problematic uh, disclosures that, that the declarant has made before you've submitted a written declaration in the IPR. Lesson two just relates to choosing the IPR team. And I think that everybody agrees that you need to have both experienced patent prosecution attorneys involved to some extent as well as experienced patent litigation attorneys. And uh, there's, there's many examples that we've seen in the first year of proceedings from decisions by the board that highlight why this is true. For example, in one proceeding, uh, we, we saw a situation where the board was being very um, specific about wanting to have support cited for a proposed amendment in the priority document or the application as filed, 
but the uh, presenting attorneys had pointed to support in an issued patent instead of the application as filed. And I think uh, for a prosecuting attorney, it would be natural to cite to the application as filed. Um, for others, it, it might not be such, such a natural thing to do, but that's one example of how this uh, comes up in an IPR. And on the flip side of that, in terms of being able to uh, detect all possible objections to evidence that's being submitted and making appropriate objections under the federal rules of evidence, as well as being able to conduct effective depositions of declarants, you absolutely need to have experienced patent litigators on the team. So this really is a hybrid proceeding that, that requires expertise on both sides. One, one follow-up point about the involvement of patent litigation attorneys is that you, there, there may be parallel patent litigation and there's a question of whether to involve the current patent litigation counsel as a member of an IPR team if IPR has been instituted. And there is some things that you need to think about, which are the prosecution bar that's a common provision in any protective order in the litigation. And while there has been some initial uh, decisions that suggest that inter-parties review is not part of prosecution, that tends to support the idea that it's okay to use your current patent litigation counsel in the IPR, there, there can still be uh, problems in situations where the to the claims, which sometimes is a tactical decision that the patent owner would want to do. So there, there are some complexities when it comes to utilizing current patent litigation counsel, but it, but it should be possible, at least to some extent, for them to be involved in the proceeding. The next lesson is about petition drafting. And the theme of today's presentation is um, separating winners from losers. Uh, and it, where we see this happening is at the petition drafting stage, when a petitioner makes a conclusory or unsupported statement about um, obviousness, uh, such as saying, oh, reference A teaches uh, all of these limitations but one, and reference B teaches the missing one, therefore it's obvious. Uh, the board um, has been getting tough on that even at the petition stage and denying the petitions um, if, for failure to uh, explain some reason to combine under KSR. So I think a best practice in light of um, the board's insistence on a KSR rationale is to go straight to the MPEP where uh, uh, there's rationales A through G listed, uh, everything from combining known elements to applying a known technique to known device, obvious to try, teaching suggestion motivation, uh, all of this should be set forth in the petition and then backed up with uh, expert declarations. Uh, next is about, so we've, we've selected the team, we've selected our expert, we've drafted the petition. Then the question is, when do you file it relative to a possible DJ suit that you can also bring, assuming that you have DJ standing? Um, the a DJ cannot be filed before filing the IPR petition, uh, but it can be filed on or after the date you file the IPR petition. Uh, and this was done for a specific reason, according to le the legislative history, because it gives the petitioner the benefit of uh, filing a DJ suit and being presumptively entitled to his choice of venue when later the patent owner sues the uh, petitioner in a different venue. 
uh, so there is a greater likelihood that the petitioner's choice of venue, the DJ forum, is where the infringement litigation will happen. And you should note that the DJ suit is automatically stayed until the patent owner moves to lift the stay, or the patent owner sues for infringement, or the petitioner or real party in interest moves to dismiss the DJ suit. So this is an interesting uh, sequencing of filing the petition with an eye towards also uh, a possible infringement litigation being uh, filed in your direction as the petitioner. Um, petitioners must um, be mindful of the one-year bar, uh, the one-year bar to, in which to file the IPR petition is, starts uh, on the date that the petitioner, the petitioner's real party and interest or the petitioner's privy is served with a complaint alleging infringement of the patent. And because it's not just the petitioner getting sued, um, that triggers this uh, one-year bar, but also the real party in interest or privy, you need to be mindful of suits being filed against uh, related corporate entities as well as customers, because in some situations, a court might say that this customer of yours is a, a privy. Uh, and we do know, uh, based on one, um, non, one in designated as informative decision, Motorola Mobility, uh, IPR decision that served with a complaint in this statutory provision means uh, services of, of a summons, not just the filing of the suit and not just receiving a courtesy copy of the complaint, but it's actually the service of the summons. And if this one-year bar has passed, um, you should consider whether uh, the patent qualifies as a covered business method patent because there, there is no time limit to file the CBM. Uh, but instead, the CBM is triggered by being sued uh, or your real party in interest or privy being sued or charged with infringement. So I, I apologize to those who aren't members of Kansas, New York, and New Jersey Bar, but we have to provide a special CLE code at this point in the conference for those people who are members of, of those states. And the CLE code for this conference is the number one and then the letters PYE, all capital. Again, that's the number one, PYE. Another lesson that we're um, seeing play out is a joinder of petitions. Uh, so it's the joinder practice. Uh, and under the AIA, uh, the director has the discretion to join as a party to the IPR or PGR uh, any per person who files a petition for IPR or PGR. Um, and importantly, this so essentially you have an already instituted proceeding going on filed by one petitioner and you as a uh, you third party want to join in on the petitioner side and, and help out with the attack on the patent. Uh, this is the procedure that uh, you can use to do that. Uh, interestingly, the one-year litigation bar from the previous slide uh, does not apply to these um, uh, motions for joinder. But if you do want to do this, uh, the board has laid out what it wants to see in terms of a motion for joinder. Uh, you need to set forth the reasons why the joinder is appropriate, identify any new grounds of unpatentability that you're asserting, and we've seen that the board does not want uh, an entirely different petition with lots of new grounds. Um, we have seen in one case that up to two new grounds is permissible based on new prior art, but in that case the prior art was cited as an exhibit in the original petition by the first petitioner. So it was not brand new uh, art, really. Uh, and you need to explain what impact Joinder will have on the trial schedule. You, uh, it, it's a good practice. You, you increase your likelihood of Joinder by agreeing to the already set briefing schedule. 
and uh, address how to, this is going to simpl simplify discovery uh, relative to two different proceedings going on. And, and given the point that Andy made earlier about the significant number of IPRs that are being settled, if you're a defendant in a multi-defendant litigation and one of the defendants initiates IPR, joinder may be one way to get involved with the proceeding that allows you to be uh, a part of that settlement or at least to have access to the proceedings to, to, to be involved. Um, another way would be to file your own separate IPR based on the best prior art you can find. But given the fact that settlement is occurring, um, co-defendants in multi-defendant litigation may want to think about what to do when an IPR is filed. So lesson seven relates to the importance of avoiding inconsistent statements during an inter-parties review. There's an affirmative duty um, which was adopted in the final rules of practice to disclose information that is inconsistent with the position advanced by the party in a filing in the IPR. So this affirmative duty applies to both parties and it requires that you think about whenever you have parallel patent litigation or other pending prosecution of related applications, whether you're advancing a position that might be inconsistent with something filed in the IPR. And if there is an inconsistency, you need to disclose it up front and address it proactively in the inter-parties review. And you can expect that your opponent is going to be looking for any opportunity to, to use this rule against you. So that they will go out and look at the litigation records and look at the other file histories of related patents and try to find those inconsistent statements. Um, of course, you have to be careful to comply with any protective order uh, so that you don't disclose information in the inter-parties review from a litigation that you're not allowed to disclose. But, but this is a, a very important lesson as well. Lesson eight relates to avoiding prosecution disclaimer. I think um, many of you are familiar with the fact that when you amend a claim or add a new claim uh, in, in an inter-parties re-exam or inter-parties review, that creates something called intervening rights. Um, but even if you don't amend the claims or add any new claims and you just present arguments to distinguish your original claims over the prior art, that can create prosecution disclaimer, which may completely eliminate damages um, up to the point of, of that statement being made in the record and may limit the scope of the patent downstream so that it doesn't apply to certain subject matter. So the, the lesson here is to be as precise as you possibly can when you're making an argument to distinguish the prior art. You don't want to summarize in a general way uh, what, what you're distinguishing in the prior art because that may unnecessarily surrender more scope than you need to. Lesson nine relates to the practice of making amendments in inter-parties review. And I think that this is a surprise to a lot of people that it, it's really somewhat difficult to make amendments during an inter-parties review. The board has issued some informative decisions, uh, one of which is Idle Free versus Bergstrom, and they've laid out very specific requirements that you have to comply with whenever you want to make an amendment. 
you have to state exactly which claim is being replaced by which amended claim. You have to explain how the amended claim distinguishes over the prior art. And you have to specify the contingency for entering the amendment on a claim by claim basis. So if you only want the amendment to be entered in the event that claims one through four of the original claims are invalid, you have to lay that out specifically. So this is not a, uh, a free open season for amending claims. Now what's interesting is that the board has, at the same time they've uh, narrowed the circumstances in which they will allow amendments during inter-parties review, they have actually offered to parties in these proceedings the possibility of using other proceedings such as ex parte reexamination or reissue to introduce amendments. And this uh, raises a question that was asked by one of the members of our audience. If a reissue proceeding is filed during an inter-parties review, um, and let's say it was for the purpose of adding some new claims, what would the board do? Would they stay the reissue um, and wait for the outcome of the inter-parties review? And that's a really good question. I'm not exactly sure how the board uh, would, would treat the reissue. I think it would depend when it was instituted uh, in the proceeding, in the inter-parties review proceeding, but if it came at the end, near the end of the proceeding in the inter-parties review, I think they would probably try to finish the inter-parties review, and I think their priority would be to meet their statutory deadline for inter-parties review in any case. So they're going to try to reach that decision, and that might mean staying the reissue or allowing the reissue to continue on a parallel track, but I don't think it will mean that the board is going to delay the inter-parties review. Yeah, I think um, on the stay of reissue question, uh, it's going to depend on what grounds, what, what prior art is before, and what issues are triggering the reissue, uh, and if it's brought within the two-year broadening window. So assume it's brought outside of the broadening reissue window, so you can only li narrow the claims, and um, the reissue is not introducing things like uh, Section 112, which cannot be considered in the IPR. Uh, there is some indication um, from the PTO that they would would not stay uh, the case brought outside the broadening window and on issues that are all uh, in the IPR. But if there's things going on in the IPR that that cannot be done in the uh, I'm sorry, if there's things going on in the reissue like a broadening of claims, uh, which makes the claims more likely to get invalidated over the prior art, uh, and then there's 112 issues in the reissue, uh, it's less likely to be stayed. And then the uh, second part of uh, this audience member's question is, if the IPR is successful and all claims are found invalid, can the reissue proceed on narrower claims than those found invalid in the IPR? Uh, and this is answered in this specific rule on this slide um, that there is a form of estoppel that the PTO has created by rule uh, that bars a patentee from obtaining in any patent, uh, so that's the same patent, a reissue of this patent, or a uh, continuation filed uh, if the claim is not patentably distinct from a finally refused or canceled claim. So you need to be presenting patentably distinct claims in the, uh, in the reissue, for example. And I can add one more data point. We, we have a situation, it doesn't involve inter-parties review, but it involved an inter-parties re-exam where the patentee filed a reissue 
early in the proceeding. And in that case, uh, the board and the patent office allowed both the reissue and the inter-parties re-exam to continue on separate parallel tracks. So uh, based on that one data point, it, it would, wouldn't necessarily um, you know, mean that they would follow that in an inter-parties review situation, but I think there's at least a, po a possibility that they would allow these other proceedings to continue on parallel tracks. And the final slide, final lesson, has to do with settlement uh, practice. Uh, so as mentioned, IPR gives the parties the ability to settle, unlike in re-exam. Um, and what we are seeing is that the board is coming up in its um, unpublished decisions. These are not marked as precedential, not marked as informative, but this is happening uh, repeatedly where the board is requiring that the parties who, are, who want to settle um, include a joint motion that sets forth uh, why termination is appropriate, identifies all co-defendants in any related suit involving the patent, and uh, gives them the current status of each related suit with respect to each party. Uh, they need to file a true copy, that is an unredacted version of the settlement agreement. And if available to the board uh, and to the Department of Justice. Um, and we are seeing as well, if you come in, if the parties come in with just like a one-page settlement agreement that only discusses the IPR and, and does not mention any ongoing litigation, the board then takes the further step of requiring the parties to certify that there are no ancillary agreements or uh, written or oral uh, like licenses or covenants not to sue relating to the patent, um, and that there are no other infringement suits involving the patent. And this all, we have not seen a denial, a refusal on, on policy grounds to settle yet, but uh, this potentially opens the possibility to, um, you know, maybe a reverse payment considerations. Um, and I, on that point, Ed, um, maybe what are your What's your perspective on, from a uh, brand versus generic um, point of view on, on settlement practice, given this? Well, it certainly, I guess now that you, again, that you do have that ability to settle these, uh, these uh, proceedings, one of the questions that, that I would have, and say there's a, a, a branded company that has a, you know, a portfolio covering one of their products, they have a pending application, and you may already have, say, some non-infringement positions that you're going to, for the for the patents that they have existing, and this may be long before you even file your end. You're preparing one, you're, you're looking over the patents, you're, you're going through that process, but you see one that they're about to uh, issue. That's about to come issue, and you want to go. And again, this is before you have even settled uh, or even filed an end, but you may want to challenge. Again, you can under the post grant. You can go after those patents, I guess, nine months within nine months after they issue. So the thought is, if you're going after that early to, to kind of get that patent out of the way, uh, I presume those would still have to be filed with the FTC or, or some notice maybe given to the FTC. Even you know, the question I would have, though, even before you even filed the ANDA, which may take you out of the, the MMA context. Well, thanks, Ed. That concludes the covered materials, and at this point I'd like to invite any members of the audience to type in their questions in the chat box that should be appearing on their screen, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer those questions in the remaining minutes. So I'll pause for just a moment to see if uh, anybody else from the audience has additional questions.
Well, I think we've um, reached the top of the hour, and uh, I want to thank everybody who took the time to join us today. Uh, if, if there are other questions, um, please feel free to email us, and I believe that uh, an email link will be provided to those who registered that provides a copy of the slides. Um, and uh, thank you again for joining us, and thank you to my co-presenters, Ed and Andy. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you all for your participation today.